clear that a substitute for fossil fuel transportation is necessary, and while biofuels may be one element to the diverse array of solutions, some say hydrogen is the answer. Hydrogen, like electricity, is a secondary form of energy, so you have to create it. Fundamentally, you can take and make hydrogen from um, most anything. You can make it from coal, you can make it from uh, fuel or natural gas. The concern about that is, is that that will contribute to uh, carbon dioxide levels in the environment, or you can make it actually from splitting water with electricity. And in the E Vermont project that uh, we're talking about mostly here today, that's how it's done. It's taking electricity from a renewable source of energy, wind, to break the uh, chemical bond of, of the hydrogen and oxygen of water. We use hydrogen to displace gasoline in a, in a somewhat conventional vehicle, a hybrid electric vehicle. The heart of the station is called the electrolyzer, and that's where the cell stacks live. We capture the hydrogen and then store it at a high pressure as a gas. And then we take it once at pressure, it is then dispensed through a, uh, much like a gasoline dispenser looks like, a dispenser to the vehicle onto the onboard fuel tanks. This demonstration project, I think, provides us a great opportunity to get experience um, with hydrogen. It allows us to uh, understand and explore how do you create this fuel, because again, it's a secondary form of energy. And how you create it is very important in terms of what its environmental implications are. It also, it allows us to get experience with users in terms of how do you handle this fuel um, in terms of its storage at a location and then its dispensing for a use. The hydrogen economy offers incredible potential and perhaps someday we'll get there. But currently the most promising alternative for our transportation system is based on our existing electrical infrastructure. So electricity and cars have actually been tied together since day one. Thomas Edison helped Henry Ford figure out the uh, coil and the spark plugs and the uh, distributor. And so Thomas Edison was in on the evolution and the design of the original Fords. Mrs. Ford didn't like the noise and the smoke and the, sort of the racket of the old Fords, so Thomas Edison built her an electric Ford. It still exists, it still runs, it's now a museum piece, um, but Mrs. Ford drove one of the very, very first electric cars. The cool thing about electricity is that if anything is more distributed than gasoline, it's electricity. We have wired the country already. I love the idea of electrifying our vehicle, and I do think that Americans and Vermonters were very attached to our individualized vehicles. Um, if you have them electrified and using electricity, then you can have the diversity in the fuel source in the generation of the electricity. So how does electricity move automobiles? For comparison, let's start with a quick overview of the combustion engine. What we're really doing is causing the air that's been compressed in this little space to heat up. When we light the gasoline and burn it, it, it expands the air and that forces this, this piston down. And that force is what we capture to turn the tire. Well, that in itself is pretty cool, but all the junk that leads up to it and the exhaust that comes out after it, we can sidestep all that by using this, this electric motor that uses this magnetic force that has no moving parts and it's just this invisible, clean force. Let's just get past the misinformation and, and get to the, to the hard facts that, that these things can work. There are challenges with electric vehicles, but look, I'm just the guy on the dirt road in Vermont and look what I was able to build. Electric cars are currently being made at the end of dirt roads and in small garages, and fortunately in high school auto shops. Topher Waring is teaching future generations at Lake Region Union High School the mechanics of electric vehicles. One of the neat things of being a, a, a teacher and working with electric cars is that the gasoline-driven economy is going to come to an end, and realistically that's that's out there a ways, you know, maybe 30 years, but it's definitely within the lifetime of my students. 
So the more kids who are thinking about this, the more kids who are invested in it, the more kids who contemplate the idea that I can have my transportation, but we're going to do it some other way. Maybe some of them will become engineers, some of them maybe politicians who will push an agenda to have a cleaner transportation system. So how do we move around? How do we do our business? How do we uh, take care of our family needs with transportation in a way that doesn't have that kind of impact? And a pure battery electric vehicle, um, if all of the pieces can be drawn together, um, is the answer. One of its elegance is its simplicity. It's a, it's a battery or, or, or vessel to store electricity. It's some sort of electronic controller um, and then a motor. Those are the three major elements of, of the electric vehicle. And it's a motor that doesn't really require spark plugs and oil changes and things of that nature. So not only uh, there's no emission from the vehicle, but there's no uh, waste products as we know them now, no waste oil to change uh, and get rid of, no oil filters, no spark plugs and those types of things. So, so from a, a, a simplicity and elegance point of view, those are the attributes of an electric vehicle. We're really at the beginning phase of this transition uh, to electric drive transportation for our vehicles. And we're seeing that uh, today with uh, the hybrid electric vehicles, which are very popular uh, here in Vermont, most, if not all, major auto manufacturers have announced plans to uh, bring plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles to the market. The hydrogen cars, electric cars, and gasoline cars all need a support system. They need an infrastructure. The gasoline infrastructure is on the order of between two and three trillion dollars worth of equipment and pipelines and pumps and gas stations and trucks and all that kind of stuff. That's what it takes to support our current transportation. The nice thing about electric cars is that that infrastructure exists. Essentially everywhere in the country is wired. Essentially everywhere in the country has power. Everything's great about electric cars, but um, the one issue is, is battery technology. We need to have the electricity stored in that plastic box, and that is very tricky and difficult to do, to have uh, a lot of energy stored in a box that's not very heavy and can hang on to it for many days waiting for us to use it. Most people don't travel very far, um, but people are used to having a car where you can travel the five miles to school and the six miles to your grocery store and then on the weekends hop in it and drive your 380 miles to grandmom's house. It's that long drive that the, like, that the battery technology currently is struggling with. Lead acid batteries and nickel metal hydride batteries can't. And so the hope rests with lithium ion. It's vastly superior to lead acid batteries and the nickel metal hydride batteries that we are finding in current hydroelectric vehicles. 40 miles is the quick rule of thumb for sort of an ordinary electric vehicle. If you can get an electric car, that has a nominal range of 300 miles or 400 miles before you need to recharge it, um, the, and you get a manufacturer who's willing then to make these things, then you're home free. Um, people will buy them. And not only will they buy them because they're cheaper to run, they'll be cheaper to maintain, and they'll be stunningly good for the environment. Um, we have the batteries, but they're new technology and they're very expensive. So lithium ion batteries can do it, lead acid batteries and nickel metal hydride batteries can't. Um, so that's where the hybrids come in. Which is what's going on right now with the Priuses. The next step will be a plug-in hybrid, which enables them to enjoy the benefits of an electric car, but still have that assurance, that sense of security of having an internal combustion engine that can burn fuel, and eventually we'll be able to get past that and people will adapt to the idea that it's okay to drive with just batteries and uh, you will get there and life will be okay. Over the years, uh, we've been looking at this concept which has become known as vehicle to grid. As tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of vehicles are connecting to the electric power system, we've been looking at these vehicles as not only charging from the grid, but also providing power back to the grid during periods of emergencies or during uh, regular operation to maintain the reliability of the power system. 
in more long term, uh, we've been looking at these uh, grid-connected cars as providing storage for intermittent resources such as wind and solar. One thing that we've looked at uh, through our work with the University of Vermont's Transportation Research Center is to figure out how many vehicles could the Vermont grid support without having to build new power plants or to build more transmission and distribution lines. That if you can um, delay the charging of plug-in hybrids or electric vehicles to the evening and early morning hours, that uh, the Vermont electric grid could support a large number of vehicles, uh, 100,000, 200,000 plug-in hybrids or electric vehicles without having to uh, purchase or build new power plants. Transportation is a huge challenge. But I do believe um, that plug-ins and electric vehicles are, are an exciting part of the solution, and I believe it's going to be here much quicker than people actually anticipate. Thirty years ago, we tried to deal with transportation energy. Progress was made, first establishing uh, fuel efficiency standards. Um, that uh, was not carried forward, um, and now we're facing the issue of transportation energy again, and I think we're looking at it um, in a in an area where we actually understand the climate constraints or the environmental constraints better. We are uh, in a very risky position, I believe, in that we're wholly dependent on oil for our transportation purposes. And, and so we have some history which suggests that that can cause uh, some problems uh, as shortages emerge, when prices rise. And so I think we need to think more broadly about how to address transportation. Um, I think plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles is one part of the solution. But we need to look at um, many other alternatives, mass transit, encouraging carpooling, uh, looking at land use patterns so that we're less dependent on the automobile to get from point A to point B. For the last 50 years in America, transportation engineering and transportation science has really been dominated by mostly civil engineers, also people who do operations research um, in business, but it's been very much civil engineers owning transportation. And that came logically out of the building of the interstates. We were building interstates, civil engineers build things. But now we see that our transportation problems for the 21st century are not building problems. And if you really think about it, transportation is, is not civil engineering, it's, it's psychology. Um, it's, it's meeting your needs, it's economics, it's you need to travel to get to work. Um, you need to go and get food somewhere if you're not a farmer. Um, if you are a farmer, you need to get your food to the marketplace and to the people in the city. And so it's, it's really all about social science and science meeting. People don't just want mobility, they want quality of life. And so therefore we have to stop and say, well, how do we design a system that will allow for a lifestyle that provides quality of life? The transportation system that we've developed in the United States has largely provided the framework for our American society. We have the freedom to move around, make choices, and create diverse lifestyles. Often, however, we find time spent traveling compromises our quality of life. As we move into the future, we realize that not only must we modernize our transportation infrastructure, we must also reconsider the design of our communities and social behavior. Once again, Vermont scientists are charting the course. I'm Amy Seidel. Join me next time for more Emerging Science. <laughs>